It's 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10, live from Jerusalem, our top story. The victims of a proxy war who just want the end to come. As Israel and Hezbollah battle across Israel's border with Lebanon, we report from a Palestinian refugee camp in Beirut. They don't fear a retaliation. They don't fear an escalation. In fact, many of them actively encourage it because they see it as the only route to finally, possibly, an end to this war. A show of strength from Iran, but Israel's Prime Minister says that calls for restraint from allies will not stop him from retaliating. World leaders have also all types of suggestions and advice. I appreciate it, but I want to make clear that we will make our own decisions and the State of Israel will do all that is needed to defend itself. Also tonight on Sky News at 10, the forgotten victims of the post office that predate the Horizon scandal give a new hope of justice today. Inflation in the UK falls and a declaration of victory as the Chancellor tells Sky News that Britain has achieved a soft landing. Calls for a UK-wide ban on smacking children, but the government says it is for parents to discipline their children. Authorities in the UAE deny that they carried out so-called cloud seeding before a record storm which brought chaos to Dubai Airport. And we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages. That's in our press preview from 10.30 right through to midnight. Good evening from Jerusalem. Since Iran's attack on Israel last weekend, the world has held its breath waiting for a retaliation from Israel that could spark a regional war. Tonight, despite renewed deliberations from Israel's war cabinet and an Iranian display of the weaponry used in their attack, that escalation is still yet to materialize. But the proxy war goes on, as the Iranian-backed group Hezbollah continued their attacks across Lebanon's border with Israel. Our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, has been hearing from Palestinian refugees in the Lebanese capital, Beirut, who are placing all of their hopes for peace in a decisive climax to the war. She sent this report from Beirut. Southern Lebanon is already at war and under Israeli attack. These are some of the latest, filmed by the Israeli military. There's been a worrying spike in cross-border exchanges over the past few days, with Hezbollah too sending a volley of strikes inside Israel. The militant group said this community centre was an IDF base. This is it from another angle. There were multiple injuries. Israel said they included civilians. It's led to increased urgency from those inside Lebanon as the Israeli government ponders how or whether to respond to Iran's weekend drone and missile attacks. I hope that, you know, the foreign ministers in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem, wherever they are, they succeed with them not to retaliate, take it easy, and not to start a war with the, Israel, with the Iranians. And they started it. They were hitting... Iranians in many Syrian areas, and Iran was not uh, retaliating. But now after you hit its consulate, you know, you can't stop them. In the Lebanese camps filled with Palestinians who fled their homes in previous Israeli wars, there's more frustration than fear at what they see as Western double standards. And, uh, is it the Let them respond, this man says, referring to the Israelis. The Israelis are only a tool of the Americans and take their orders from the US, UK and France, he says. The alleyways of Shatila camp are held by different Palestinian political factions, but the onslaught over the border has brought them together. Even two to three generations on, a lot of these people still consider themselves refugees. They're exhausted by war, but they don't fear a retaliation. They don't fear an escalation. In fact, many of them actively encourage it because they see it as the only route to finally, possibly, an end to this war and being able to return to where they came from. And that is the nub. Without a Palestinian state, they believe here and in the Lebanese government that there can be no peace. The memory of PLO leader Yasser Arafat, who brought them closest to peace in generations, still looms large here. And the PLO leader in the camp appealed to British people to help them. And I tell to Britain once that the struggle is not against terrorism. It's uh, against uh, 
Palestinian rights. The Iranian-backed Hezbollah militia is a powerful force in Lebanon, stronger than the Lebanese army and embedded in Lebanese politics. Taking them on is very different to tackling Hamas in Gaza. Hezbollah form a very strong part of the axis of resistance, which includes the Yemeni Houthis, Iraqi Hezbollah and groups in Syria. And that is very much a worry. It will be a huge risk for Israel because it will lead to a big war in the region. It won't be limited to Lebanon. It will definitely spread to Yemen and most probably to the Syrian Golan. And the situation will be out of control of any international power and very bad for the region. These are intensely worrying times for those in the region, with many feeling with every day there's a step closer to all-out regional war. Alex Crawford, Sky News in Beirut. Well, that conflict between Israel and Hezbollah is just a small-scale example of the horrors that a wider regional conflict might bring. Today, the leaders of Israel and Iran restated their determination to take any necessary action, even as the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, used his latest visit to the region to call for restraint. Our Middle East correspondent, Alastair Bunkle, reports. Today, in the sort of military parade that regimes love, Iran put on a display of some of the drones and long-range missiles fired at Israel on Saturday night. Iran is on high alert, expecting Israel to strike any day now. The country's leader warned that that would be a mistake. If the tiniest invasion is made by the Zionist regime against our homeland or our interests, the Israelis must be certain that they will face a very harsh response. In Jerusalem, the British Foreign Secretary met with the Israeli Prime Minister. The assumption amongst Western governments now is that Israel will strike back. And so the diplomacy is aimed at limiting the potential consequences of that. Are you any clearer about what Israel plans by way of response? Well, we wanted to demonstrate our solidarity with Israel because it was an appalling attack by Iran. But to be clear, we have repeated our view that any response should be smart uh, and that should be designed in a way that is going to limit and try to de-escalate this conflict. Nobody wants to see this uh, conflict grow and spread. Netanyahu, who has barely been heard of since the weekend attacks on his country, chaired a meeting of the cabinet today. World leaders have also all types of suggestions and advice. I appreciate it, but I want to make clear that we will make our own decisions and the state of Israel will do all that is needed to defend itself. The crisis with Iran might have briefly distracted from the ongoing war in Gaza, but the hostage crisis remains unresolved and many people are losing patience with a leader they don't trust. Although many Israelis would support a retaliation against Iran, a significant number here are still opposed to the Netanyahu government and blame them for not getting the hostages in Gaza home yet. In Gaza, more humanitarian aid is finally getting in, but there is still a problem with distributing it, especially to the north. The fighting also continues, and fears of an invasion of Rafa remain. Israel is still unable to win and extricate itself from one war, but might be on the brink of starting another. Alistair Bunkle, Sky News, in Jerusalem. Well, for more analysis, let's bring in our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, who's here with me live. Um, Dom, I mean, there's been a lot of shuttle diplomacy as well. We saw Lord Cameron here. Is anything starting to shift? Well, we've gone from take the win, don't do anything, to, OK, if you're going to do something, then please don't jeopardise the coalition that acted so decisively on Saturday and don't plunge the region into a massive uh, expanding and, and escalating conflict. So you kind of wonder what a few more days is going to do. I mean, it's been a day where we've seen allies come and repeat that call for restraint, but the Israeli Prime Minister saying, I'm going to do what I want on my clock for the uh, good of Israel and 
kind of hinting that um, he's getting lots of advice, but he's not going to necessarily listen to it. It's all about what he thinks is right for Israel. It's also been a day uh, where the Iranians have warned again that the tiniest invasion, they said, could lead to a massive, harsh response, but also a day where a former Israeli spy chief has raised the spectre in your interview with him of Israel striking nuclear facilities in Iran, or certainly not ruling it out. So it's, I think it's another kind of what could possibly go wrong moment for the Middle East, and we're still with bated breath, waiting to see what happens. It's also, I think, very important to, to point out that even put aside what the war cabinet does, there's still the potential for this conflict to kind of expand and spontaneously get into a much worse situation just by the kind of dynamic that's going on at the moment. And that was borne out by that attack, that exchange today, that where at least 14 Israeli soldiers have been injured, some of them seriously. Now, if that drone or whatever it was from Hezbollah had killed 14 Israeli soldiers, then we could be looking at a very different situation tonight. Equally, if a Houthi missile hits a, a, a hotel in Alat and flatten that, killing lots of Israeli tourists. So, you know, we're still one missile potentially away from a massive regional conflict, regardless of what the Israeli war cabinet does as well. Still a very dangerous situation and at the moment not getting any more, uh, not getting any safer. No, it does certainly feel like a dangerous moment. Uh, Dom, thank you so much for all of that. Well, we will continue to follow all the developments here from Jerusalem, but for, for now, uh, back to you, Anna, in London. Yalda, thank you. The inquiry into the post office scandal and the failures of the Horizon IT system continued to hear evidence today. But the victims of the predecessor to Horizon, a system called Capture, remain largely in the shadow, still waiting for justice and compensation. But today marked a potential breakthrough after they met the post office minister, Kevin Hollenraig, who agreed to have an independent IT expert review the Capture evidence. Sky Zadell Robinson has more. Welcome to Capture. This is a software that's destroyed so many lives. This is proof of a second post office IT scandal, according to former sub postmasters like Steve. It crashes and then you've got to start Capture again. It's software the post office rolled out to branches in the 90s before Horizon with apparent glitches. Showing a shortage of £4,900. Steve says he was wrongly convicted of stealing thousands in 1998 and that the faulty capture systems to blame. It came to the point for us that we had to sell our wedding rings and everything because it got so bad at one point. And to lose that was... That was just heartbreaking. It's just not right. The next step has got to be for exoneration because this has been hanging over the head for over, the, well, for nearly 30 years now. Something that we didn't do, something that I didn't do. It's not just about me, it's about the other people as well. We, we want justice, pure and simple, we want justice. Is it Carly lost? Steve Lewis claims capture at his branch in Wales led to him being sacked too. We've always been um, looked on as being the man who robbed the post office, you know. He lost his business and home after raising concerns about the software. Because I just, um, uh, I just, um, it just takes everything away from you, you know, your, your confidence, your, your patter. Looking back now, uh, yeah, it was uh, the worst time of my life. Um, I'd lost a, a good number of friends over it because they all thought the stigma of it. Um, both my parents were alive at the time and um, <clears throat> they're not with us now, but they lived the shame as well. Now, after a meeting with MPs and Steve, the post office minister has agreed to have an independent expert review capture evidence. What we want to do now with the consent of government and with the agreement of DBT is run that past an independent person so we can stand up what we say is the case, that, it's, that there is a very similar pattern of IT glitches that predate the horizon period by a number of years. At the moment, those prosecuted through capture aren't allowed compensation or have convictions overturned. But there's growing momentum and evidence of striking similarities between the way post office dealt with horizon victims and those affected by capture, a system prone to bugs and glitches that the post office knew about. 
Post Office say they're actively investigating, sharing a recommendation with government on what should happen next. While time is pressing for those like Steve and potentially many more whose cases go back three decades. Adele Robinson, Sky News. Inflation has fallen to its lowest level in two and a half years, driven largely by slowing food price rises. That has led to the Chancellor declaring victory with a boast that Britain has achieved a soft landing from the recent economic turmoil. Our economics editor, Ed Conway, has been speaking to him in Washington. As finance ministers convene here in Washington, the clouds of conflict are hanging heavy in the Middle East, in Ukraine. But it's a domestic problem they're most worried about, inflation. The latest UK data is showing it's falling, but not as low as expected. The Chancellor says even so, the big picture is promising. The economy we are seeing has turned a corner. Uh, people are beginning to feel that, and that will continue, I think, during the course of this year. But the fundamentals for the UK economy, yes, are very strong indeed. But do you have anything to say to people who, you know, they've been feeling this, this cost of living crisis for so long, inflation, like I say, yes, it is coming down, but it's not quite going down as quickly as people expected. What, what kind of hope can you give them if, they're, if they've been really struggling for this period? Well, look at where we are compared to after Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine, when we had inflation at 11%. The Bank of England saying we were going to have the longest recession in 100 years. Since then, we've seen living standards go up. We've seen the economy more or less have a soft landing with the IMF, as I say, saying we're going to grow faster than any other major European economy. We don't pretend that it's been tough. It's been very tough in the UK and in many other countries. Saying Britain has achieved a post-energy crisis soft landing is a big claim and might turn out to be a hostage to fortune. But the Bank of England governor also thinks that even though inflation isn't coming down quite as fast as expected, his plan's working too. What we're seeing is that these global, sh global shocks to inflation are unwinding. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that's obviously very good news. Now, where we are today is, and we've had numbers you know, obviously this morning uh, in the UK, is that we're actually pretty much on track for where we thought we would be at the beginning of February. That seems to imply at least one cut later this year, but this story isn't over yet. There's this phrase being bandied around at these meetings, the last mile. A lot of these central bankers and finance ministers are desperately keen that they can say that after two years of inflation pain, finally those interest rates are starting to have an impact and we are coming to the end of that cost of living crisis. The problem is that some of that data is suggesting that maybe this isn't the last mile. Maybe actually this is only the middle of a long, painful journey. For the time being, everyone here is keeping their fingers crossed, hoping stronger American growth leads the world towards a recovery. Hoping that soft landing the Chancellor says he's achieved is actually happening. Ed Conway, Sky News in Washington. The House of Lords has once again frustrated the government's efforts to pass the Rwanda bill and finally get its plans to deal with asylum seekers into law. The bill had been expected to pass its final parliamentary hurdle tonight, but Pearce had other ideas, again, sending it back to the Commons. The government accused Labour of stopping at nothing to stop planes taking off for Rwanda. Here's our political editor, Beth Rigby. <laughs> The government desperate to get its illegal immigration bill through this place and into law, but tonight thwarted again. My Lords, they have voted contents 245, not contents 208, so the contents have it. Piers amending the Rwanda bill for the fourth time delays the Prime Minister can ill afford if he's to get the planes away by the end of May. If the government wanted to, it could accept these amendments and it would not delay the bill at all. So if they were serious about that, they'd be there tonight, wouldn't they? They'd have turned up tonight to look at it again. They're not. The government have gone home. But Tories say Labour are to blame. They're just delaying this policy. They seem to be terrified that it will work and they're doing everything to delay it. So, of course, I'm extremely disappointed. <laughs> Lord sending the tweet legislation back to the Commons for the fifth time after MPs earlier rejected all of their proposed changes. So the eyes have it, the eyes have it, the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Are not. There's huge frustration in government tonight that the Lords have delayed the Rwanda bill again. 
frustration too from some Conservative MPs who think the government should have forced late night sittings to make sure Parliament passed the legislation this week. And all the while the clock is ticking down on the Prime Minister's promise to get flights away to Rwanda by the end of spring, a pledge upon which he staked it all. Frustration hitting voters in Sky's target town too. Voters in Cleethorpes all out of faith. They tell you what, you what they think that you want to hear and when it actually comes down to it, they don't actually deliver that. They deliver something completely different. Whatever they do, they can't put anything through because everyone's against them, aren't they? Nothing's happening. There's nobody gone to Rwanda. They get on the plane and then they're taken off, you know, so... It's just it's another failed thing that they've promised. The PM determined to prove the doubters wrong, but his plan still tangled up in Parliament and the small boats keep coming. Beth Rigby, Sky News, Westminster. Now, a familiar debate on child discipline got a fresh impetus today after a leading group of doctors said that smacking children should be banned across the UK. The Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health has urged ministers in England and in Northern Ireland to follow the lead of Wales and Scotland, where bans are already in place. Sky's Alice Porter reports. Are you sorry that Mum hit you? Has this happened before? When does smacking become abuse? What's going on for you today? Childline provides support for young people, including those who are physically disciplined by their parents. Children who are physically punished at home, what they often tell us is that they feel confused about the feelings from their parents. So if you're being hit by someone, they're telling you they love you, there's a bit of conflict there. With the law as it stands at the moment, does it make it difficult when you're on a call to a child to work out the severity of the violence that they're experiencing? It certainly can make it harder because it means that there is a bit of a loophole at the moment in the law where people can essentially assault a child and that's legal. Currently, if a child is smacked, hit or slapped in England and Northern Ireland, parents can argue that this was reasonable punishment and avoid breaking the law. But research from the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health suggests any corporal punishment can have a lasting impact. They found children who had experienced physical punishment were 2.6 times more likely to develop poorer mental health than those who weren't smacked. And they were 2.3 times more likely to suffer an injury which would require medical attention. Their study also found that smacking encouraged children to be more aggressive and believe that violence is accepted. In places where physical punishment of children is used, it can make it much more difficult for paediatricians and other members of the team caring for children to work out whether or not this is a child who's been subjected to abuse or it's a parent who's had a momentary loss of control. The government says parents are trusted to discipline their children but smacking divides opinion. There's no need for it. Like, there really isn't. It's an old-fashioned thing. There's, there's easier ways to discipline your child. Yeah, I think when a child's about to stick their hand in their fire and you tap the hand and say, no, that's hot, that's going to hurt you, I think so from a preventative point of view of them ever getting into any danger, I don't see really the harm in it. It didn't harm me. Striking a child is already illegal in Scotland and Wales. The question is whether England and Northern Ireland will follow suit. Alice Porter, Sky News. Sussex police have apologised for mistakes made in their initial investigation into the murders of two girls in 1986 and the wrongful arrest of one of their fathers. Nicola Fellows and Karen Hadaway, who were both nine, were sexually assaulted and killed by paedophile Russell Bishop. He was acquitted at his first trial in 1987, but finally convicted in 2018 after a retrial. At least 17 people were killed and more than 60 injured when the Ukrainian city of Cherniv was hit by three Russian missiles. An eight-storey apartment building was left in ruins. The attack came as Ukraine waits for a new US military aid package to be voted on by the US Congress this weekend.
Sunnies understands that the Scottish Government is expected to water down its climate targets tomorrow. Scotland has missed eight of the past 12 annual targets and the Climate Change Committee has said its aim of cutting greenhouse emissions by 75% by 2030 is beyond what is credible. And Hugh Grant has settled his privacy case against the publisher of The Sun. The actor said he didn't want to accept what he called the enormous amount of money he'd been offered by newsgroup newspapers, but a trial was likely to prove expensive as he'd have to pay both sides legal costs, even if he won. Authorities in the United Arab Emirates have denied that record rainfall, which flooded major roads and Dubai airport, was exacerbated by so-called cloud seeding, a practice used in the region to provoke increased rain. The extreme weather was felt across the Gulf region, with 18 people killed in Oman and more missing. Thousands of UK travellers due to leave from Dubai airport are now struggling to get home. Here's our science correspondent, Thomas Moore. The land of sand has become a world of water. At Dubai airport, planes ploughed through floods as intense thunderstorms brought the most extreme rainfall on record and there were reports of several deaths. So this is not a time lapse, this is real. I've never seen this much lightning in my life before. This is crazy. One region just south of the city had 25 centimetres of rain in just one day. The average in Dubai is less than 10 centimetres over an entire year. Water cascaded through luxury malls, flowed through metro stations and submerged streets. One cat had a lucky escape. Okay, so much rain in such a dry country has led to speculation that it was caused by cloud seeding. The United Arab Emirates regularly sends planes into clouds to scatter tiny particles in the hope that they will draw together moisture and form raindrops. But not this time, said the authorities, and a British scientist says it was a natural weather event turbocharged by climate change. It was a well-predicted storm. People knew there would be severe rain. Most severe rainfall events occur because uh, weather systems get stuck. And indeed, this, this was a strongly developing but also slowly moving system. And it sort of all accumulates then. And we were unlucky that it accumulates over heavily populated areas in this case. Amman too was badly hit by the storm with people plucked from the torrents. The region normally receives so little rain that drains aren't built for so much water and there is more wet weather to come. Thomas Moore, Sky News. It is 100 days until the start of the Paris Olympics. The build-up to any big event is usually bedeviled with concerns about whether everything will be delivered on time. But the French president, Emmanuel Macron, has warned that the opening ceremony could be moved from its planned riverside location if the security risk is too high. From Paris, our sports correspondent, Rob Harris, has this report. The elite unit of the French police storming a boat on the Seine. This is the Olympic training usually unseen. Their target are men threatening the lives of potential passengers. These attack simulations preparing for the most ambitious opening ceremony in Olympic history. Athletes parading for the public like this, down the river on boats rather than walking around a stadium. A vast extravaganza adding to the security challenge for France and protecting athletes, the top priority for the boss of Team GB. I mean, I'm clearly I'm concerned. It's, it's one of the most important things that we have to manage from a risk perspective. Our security team that work very closely with us on a day-to-day -day basis, they then engage with all of the British security and intelligence services. Are you concerned about this opening ceremony being in the open air? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone knows that that is clearly a risky environment. And all that stuff they would expect is happening to make it as safe as it can be. And I, I'm confident it will be safe. Armed personnel, a familiar sight at Paris landmarks. And they'll be supported by British police who are being deployed here for the Games. The French government had been insistent for months they would stick with the unprecedented open air opening ceremony. But the language has been shifting and now they're talking about alternatives. And one of them is having the ceremony just here around the Trocadero site. 
France is now on a maximum terror alert. The level raised after the Islamic State group claimed responsibility for attacks on a Moscow music venue last month. Plans ever-changing for those forming crisis management strategies for companies ahead of the Olympics. The uh, security services are foiling attempts all the time. So the threat is there, but you really should look into other threats as well. And of course the cyber threat, which is in, really in everybody's mind, uh, because uh, the best way to uh, make the Olympic look bad is uh, by uh, using some type of uh, a cyber attack on uh, public displays. France securing systems brace for cyber attacks from hostile states. While across Paris, temporary venues are being readied. Iconic backdrops for a summer when France wants the spotlight on the sport. That will require the biggest security operation in the country's history being assembled over the next 100 days. Rob Harris, Sky News, Paris. Now, the holders, Manchester City, are into extra time in their Champions League quarter-final with Real Madrid. City were heading out after Rodrigo's first-half goal for Madrid before Kevin De Bruyne scored to make it one all on the night, four all on aggregate and send the tie into extra time. Keep you posted on that. Arsenal's Champions League dream, though, is over. They were knocked out by Bayern Munich. Joshua can make second half goal, enough for Bayern to win. 1-0 on the night in Munich. That is 3-2 on aggregate. Well, that was Sky News at 10. Coming up, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's newspapers in the press preview tonight. Joined, as you can see, by the Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kev McGuire, and the broadcaster and commentator, Ali Mirage. Back in just a moment.
Well, this is Sky News in just a moment, the press preview. A first look at what is on the front pages. First, though, our top stories this evening. As Israel and Hezbollah battle across Israel's border with Lebanon, Israel's Prime Minister has said calls for restraint from allies will not stop him retaliating against Iran. Former sub-postmasters have secured a potential breakthrough after a government minister agreed to have an independent review of software blamed for a second post office scandal. And the House of Lords has once again frustrated the government's efforts to pass the bill to enable some asylum seekers to be sent to Rwanda. Well, hello there. You're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what's making the headlines with the Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kev Maguire, and the broadcaster and commentator, Ali Mirage. Welcome to both of you. Good to see you. So to the front pages then, let us start with... The Eye reporting that the Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron expects that Israel will not heed international calls for restraint against Iran and will retaliate. Brexit is to blame for a shortage of drugs, which is putting lives at risk, says The Guardian. The Daily Mail leads on a poll which suggests the Tories are trailing Labour on defence, tax, migration and even Brexit. According to the Financial Times, the International Monetary Fund has told Rishi Sunak he must do more to curb UK public spending and that abolishing national insurance isn't the best way to achieve that. The Metro pictures Dubai's worst rainfall for 75 years, deluge, they say. The Sun reports that Prince Harry has officially registered himself as a resident of the United States. Well, don't forget, uh, scan the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme and you can check out the front pages for yourself of tomorrow's newspapers while you listen to our guests. Let's head straight to Kevin and uh, Ali Mirage. So, Lord Cameron uh, in Israel, uh, what did he come out with is kind of the question on the front page of the eye, isn't it, Ali? Well, well what he came out with was he's trying to urge uh, restraint on Israel, uh, but uh, a blind bit of good that's going to do because uh, Benjamin Netanyahu... Uh, the Israeli Premier has said that, uh, thank you very much for the advice, we will do exactly what we want, when we want, um, and there's no even mention of the fact that we really helped them with the shooting down of these drones. Now, clearly, uh, the UK is a very strong and staunch ally of Israel. Israel feels that uh, they have been attacked, they were attacked by Iran. Uh, Iran would argue that they were responding to an attack on their own embassy, which is their sovereign soil in Syria, on April the 1st. Uh, you could then go back and say, well, Israel will say, well, it was all Hezbollah and all the rest of it. The issue with all of this is, is could potentially lead to a regional conflagration, which is exactly what we don't need, particularly with the world economy where it is right now. And the problem with all of this is, when you had uh, the Cold War, there, were some, there was an architecture in place to try and minimise risks of miscalculation. You had strategic arms limitation treaties, you had hotlines, you don't have any of this right now. The, the difference here is you're not dealing with a proxy non-state actor like Hezbollah. You're dealing with the Iranian state. They've got... This is an ancient civilization. They've been through the Iran-Iraq war eight years. They will never forget the fact that the West was supporting Iraq in that battle until they decided to kick out Saddam. So the risk appetite of the Iranians is quite high. So they're not going to be bullied around. And the Iranians themselves are saying that they will then respond. This is exactly what we want to avoid. Yes, such is the nature of tit for tat, as we all know. Uh, Iran putting its weapons on show today as well. Um, you know, is there any difficulty of Netanyahu once again telling allies we're going to do it our way? So that, Just, yeah. when, you know, when allies were so helpful, you might argue, in bringing down these drones and ballistic missiles that were fired from Iran. Yeah, a tail wagging the dog. And, of course, the focus has gone completely from Gaza, the killing of the aid workers, 33,000 people, mainly women and children, calls for greater humanitarian relief. And all of a sudden, in, in the UK, instead of you know, a big discussion on should Israel be supplied with arms, should there be an embargo, you actually find the RAF is now doing the fighting for Israel and shooting down drones. And it, 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 the question for Cameron and Sudak, the government, is what do you do if Israel does retaliate and it brings in fresh strikes? Are you, if you urge restraint and there is no restraint, mm. do you then just get sucked into that yeah. uh, Middle East war, which will be disastrous uh, economically and, it, and maybe for the people of the Middle East uh, to losing their, their lives? So mm. as, it's a big question. Like uh, Cameron went, like, his tone has always been very sympathetic. He's quite firm, look, take the win, because it was a win. If you think the Israelis killed Iranian commanders, including a very senior general, 
in a diplomatic area of you know, Iran in, in a foreign Syria. Nation, yeah. yeah, and then uh, Iran fires 3,000, well, sorry, more 300, than 300, yeah. and they claim it's a great success. No, it wasn't a great success. Yeah. It was a the defense was the great success, well, shooting them all yeah. down, but that required mm -hmm. Jordan, the US, uh, and the UK to take part. Absolutely. So if Netanyahu wants to go off, do you just automatically follow him? What do you do with a, with a rogue ally? If they're an ally and they're acting well, well, rogue, you, what do you do? Well, 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 you've also got to think about uh, what the long-term strategy again is here, because uh, some in Israel are now saying, let's use this as a pretext to try and take out Iran's nuclear capability, uh, which is maybe much more advanced than we think it may be. Uh, and you know that uh, under Obama there was this, um, there was this uh, uh, agreement to try and do a nuclear deal. Uh, Biden was thinking about resurrecting that. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen now, but some in Israel just want to play hardball with Iran. But the wider issue here is, and this is a question for the US as well, what is the US's uh, Iran strategy? I mean, the US is, is Israel's biggest ally. What is its Iran strategy when it comes to supporting Israel, other than dividing the world into good guys and bad guys? And the Middle East, as we know, is completely shades of grey. Well, interesting. I mean, you know, Israel says, how can we allow 110 ballistic missiles to be fired at our nation and not respond? But yeah. it has focused minds in Congress, is it not? We saw Lord Cameron yeah. heading there saying, get this aid going for Ukraine mm -hmm. and obviously aid for Israel. And finally, it looks like the Speaker is bringing it to the floor uh, for, um, you know, lawmakers in America. Well, the Ukrainians yeah. are now asking the question why we're not, why we're not shooting down drones from Russia. Yeah. Yes. Right. Well, yeah. others are saying, and they'll be why asking aren't we... NATO and allies that. They quite, are. Why know, aren't we shooting down Israeli drones killing British aid? Workers. We will move on, shall we? We'll wait and see what happens again with that. There's the uh, Telegraph, Netanyahu will make our defence decisions. Uh, but let us go to the Times. Inflation figures came out. Uh, inflation fell. I know you're going to point out that it still means prices are rising. Uh, but inflation falling more slowly than expected. So what does that mean, Kevin? Yeah, um, prices are not rising as fast as they were. Uh, from 3.4 to 3.2. Expectations were 3.1, not quite there. But according to the Times, the government was banking on a whole series of interest rate uh, cuts uh, in, a, in the uh, run-up to a potential uh, November poll, um, hoping for three. Now, the markets are pricing in just a single cut. They were 14 rises to 5.25%. Per, uh, mm -hmm. percent. Uh, more than a million and a half people are due to remortgage yeah. this year. Yeah. So it will really, really matter to them. Politi and yeah, Jeremy has told our economic secretary yeah. Conway this is a, effectively a soft landing for the yeah. Oh, well, that's the thing. Look, I, I think Kevin should have been a, bit, a little bit more blunt. What it means in terms of prices is that um, crumpets and chocolate biscuits have gone down. Uh, both of which I've availed myself of today. So that's good news. It's 3.2% the inflation rate. It's not where it should have been. I think the, the, the consensus um, amongst city economists was that there would be uh, at least 1.5% of rate cuts this year. Now that looks uh, pretty unlikely. The same in the US, what, actually. So what might be expected? People will be Maybe 0.5%. It's word. difficult to tell. It's difficult to right. tell. And it's, it's anyone's a guess. Point of, uh, Probably, of because this is what is coming out now of the US. Because Jay Powell, the head of the Fed, has indicated in the last couple of weeks that inflation stickier in the US. Uh, they also are going to fight that inflation uh, for longer. And they're also now predicting, most economists in the US, the consensus forecast is 0.5%, not 1.5%. This is going to make it a lot harder for people who are refinancing their mortgages, yeah. basically. Well, they, well they're going to, it's going to go up. If you're refinancing, you're going to go up. It's That's just right. how high you go up. But you're going to go up, so you will feel the pinch. Yeah. So you're not going to be looking at the government, uh, particularly every time Liz Truss pops up to remind everybody she's around and she was an utter disaster as a Conservative Prime Minister. Yep. It just isn't going to help them politically. So going to, people are going to suffer financially, but politically it is... And a lot of companies, and a lot of companies are pretty indebted as well that took on cheap debt yeah. during the crisis. They're also going to come to refinancing points. So there is going to be some pain. Hard landing, soft landing, we hope it's soft. But I tell you, just going back to the earlier uh, story, if there's a conflagration in the Middle East, all bets are off. Yeah. One fifth of the world's oil goes through the Straits of Hormuz. Oh, I mean, it'll, be, wanna... it'll be like Putin's invasion of Ukraine again, nightmare. and inflation soared to 11.1%. Exactly. You know what happened exactly. with energy prices? Exactly. No, I mean, that's, that's why I think Cameron is right to urge restraint on yeah. Israel. Yeah. And just very quickly, in terms of the UK government hopes for the year, it being election year, one being pinned on interest yeah. rates coming down and people feeling a bit better about the economy, secondly was giving national insurance yeah. 
or reducing national insurance costs, which the FT, Ali, is suggesting, mm. hold on a second, this might not be a good idea. Well, that's going to be a dividing line in the election. You saw it at PMQs today, uh, Starmer and Sunak uh, sort of squaring off against this. What the IMF is saying, and we, we, we've had enough of experts, I believe, supposedly, <laughs> right? The IMF are basically saying, that, look, you look at your debt-to-GDP ratio. Uh -huh. It's 92% now, it could go up to 98%, uh, which is really too high. And what the IMF is basically saying is, you can't have your, your public services in, in a complete mess, which they are, with NHS waiting lists above 7 million, uh, police forces need more money, teachers need more, all sorts of things, public sector workers on strike, and yet you want to have... Um, uh, American levels of taxation in the country. It's simply not mm. going to work. The £46 billion now is being used by the Labour Party as a stick to beat the Tories with, uh, just like Liz Truss. Where's this £46 billion going to come from? I've never had enough of experts when I go to the doctors <laughs> or across a bridge. <laughs> I must say, I hope the engineers know what they're, what they're doing. But because the, the IMF are saying, look, UK debt, along with that, the US, China and Italy, is too high, mm. according to them. It's going to go up from 92% of GDP at the end of the decade to 98%, because yeah. the, the, the NI cuts we're having now are largely funded by higher borrowing. That's right. And if you're going to, what, the price tag of 46 billion has been put on yeah. by Labour yeah. on getting rid of national insurance. That's, that's em employees, not employers, but you know, you've, got to, you've got to pay for it somehow if you do it's it. It's a difficult one, though, because That's... we know that the productivity in this country has been flatlining for the last 15 years, right? So this is the problem that the government has. It's got 400 billion of borrowing on the back of COVID. It's got 2.5 trillion of public debt. The IMF saying that the debt to GDP ratio is almost going to hit 100%, and yet you need to stimulate the economy. You need to get people working. You need to increase productivity. You need to fill the potholes. You need to... Indeed, you do. <laughs> Sorry, I really do. Just see the very the front of the Daily Mail, which feeds into all of this. Tories trail Labour on defence, tax, migration, even Brexit. An exclusive poll for the Mail finds 45% still don't want a Starmer government. We will have to talk more about that a bit later on. Uh, too much to Does discuss that mean already. 55% do. <clears throat> yeah. So um, a majority. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we will talk about this man, uh, Prince Harry, after the break, and Dubai suffering its worst rainfall for 75 years, and the debate about why it happened. Back in a moment. So my dad's a magician, so um, I started because of my dad. Pretty much, when I was born, my dad grabbed me and brought me straight to the theatre because he wanted me to be a magician. <laughs> uh, do you want to see something then? Yeah, definitely. Perfect. So today, sh you can't tell no one this, I'm going to tell you the secrets of the magic circle. OK. Shh, you can't tell no one. Um, well, it's okay, sealed. So here we've got a deck of cards, so just say stop for me. Stop. Put it there. So uh, take the card, don't okay. show me. Now, it doesn't matter if I see it, because right now I'm going to show you how the trick is done. OK. So you're going to get a little mask. Oh, fine. OK. You can't tell the magic circle, I don't want to get kicked out. OK. So normally, when the people have got the card, I grab a little pen and I like to draw a little door. I'm not good at drawing. <laughs> Could be a window, but we'll go with it. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So, a little door. And the thing that I'll do, I'll probably fix this up a bit. And, um... The thing that I do is, while, they're at, while I'm asking for you, for you to look for the deck, yeah. um, I do this secretly when no-one's okay. looking. And the thing that I do is... Uh, ooh, there's one card there. I, um, I grab the card. I yep. do like I put it in the middle, but I'm actually putting it on the bottom of the deck. OK. And then, uh, so, seven of diamonds, it doesn't matter if I see it, I put right. it on the bottom. So, what does that mean? When, they, when I slide the box, the card's back inside of the box. Yeah. <laughs> I got a little peeky-peeky. OK. Do you get what I mean? Mm. I'm not watching. Little peeky peeky. Stop it. Can I see yeah, that? Yeah, go on, have a little peeky peeky. Peeky peeky. That is an actual door. I had my nails done because I knew we were getting, doing <laughs> a card and trick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, so the worst part about this trick is if they ask to examine the box. Okay. Because you're like, oh, I've got a door on the box, what should I do? Yeah. Well, I'm a real magician and I never break the rules of the magic circle. Stop it. Let me have a look at that. Have a look, have a look. Examine it. There's nothing there. I can do a quick trick. Have you got, is that sugar over there? Yeah. For your cup of tea? Give, pass me over your sugar. See, really, in my cup of teas, I prefer sugar cubes. Yeah. Uh, so put your hand out for me, quickly. Okay. I'm going to pull this out. Watch this. Okay, we've got 30 sugar, seconds. Here we go. Two. 
Oh, Shunky. there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Remember the name. <laughs> and if you Harry want to follow, if you Merlin want to... Piper. That's my name on Instagram. I'm Katie Spencer, and I'm Sky News's arts and entertainment correspondent. Uh, Maverick here on the red carpet. I'm so excited, Hello, Tom Cruise. You? Katie Spencer, Sky News in London. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview with me once again, Kevin Maguire and Ali Marish. Welcome back to both mm. of you. Government might have hoped for Royal Assent and its Rwanda bill, uh, possibly, but it did not happen. It's been kicked off into the weekend or after the weekend. Yep. Uh, deadlock over Rwanda bill set to delay flights until the summer is the suggestion for this uh, double page spread in The Times, Kevin. Yeah, The, the Times, mm -hmm. um, Matt Day from the Home Affairs editor, is saying the, the plans for spring are all but dead now because, of course, if it gets passed, Next week, you've still got to go through the legal process and deal with the challenges which will come there from, from individuals. But what a hill to die on when you basically want to send to Rwanda uh, Afghan soldiers who fought with Britons uh, against the Taliban. This is one of the amendments that yeah. is a trying I mean, to put into the bill and the government saying no amendments. I think the whole, the whole plan is uh, immoral, expensive and actually won't work. And, and interestingly, there was a poll out tonight which shows now 56% of people think it won't be a deterrent. Only 32% think they will. So even if the government says it's spring deadline, manages, manages to shackle a few people kicking and screaming onto a plane out to Rwanda in the summer, it's not going to get that political bounce now because I think the whole, the whole gimmick from Boris Johnson two years ago has been seen through. The battle's been too long. People have looked at the figures. They know how many people are coming, how many could be sent to Rwanda. Uh, the fact if you've got a criminal conviction, you don't get sent to Rwanda. You can't get sent to Rwanda. So, for instance, is Azadi, who threw some terrible substance in the face of the woman in, in London, mm. uh, wouldn't be sent to... Afghanistan, or if you go out, sorry, to, uh, to Rwanda, or if you go out to Rwanda and you commit a crime, then you're sent back to Britain. I mean, which, mm. you know, you don't want to be there, what yeah. are you going to do? Okay. You're going to commit a crime and be back. Well, I'm going to move on, if you don't mind, because of course. I've got a couple more stories. Yeah. Uh, Delhi in Dubai, front page of the Metro, FT, everywhere, uh, because of the question about why it might have happened, Ali. Well, I mean, it's this bit of speculation whether there was uh, cloud seeding going on or whether this is... Uh, climate change related, whatever it is. I mean, you've got, what, 10 inches of rainfall falling in 24 hours? I mean, this is... 18 months of rain. 18 months point, of rain. I mean, yeah. this is like, uh, let's say, the apocalypse, as, as one person has said. Um, clearly very, very bad for the economy there, for people on holiday. And it looks like, I think, Joey Essex has got caught up in this as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> national disaster. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> get, the, get the armed forces exactly. alerted. Get them out exactly. there. Bring but them other up. Middle Eastern countries also, including Oman, have also been affected by this. So it's yeah. uh, very concerning for the But world. isn't it? Come on, one of the world's great producers of carbon fuels. Well, they did have COP28 <laughs> as well. Uh, hit by uh, climate change. A little bit ironic. Yeah. And it was quite lauded, COP28. Yeah, yeah drains well. and town planning are not yeah. set up for this kind yeah. of weather exactly, system. Yeah. Some suggestion from one source that it was dust clouds that self-cloud self seeded. It was nothing yeah. to do with cloud seeding. Uh, thousands of UK travellers struggling to get home from Dubai International Airport mm. because of that intense storm, we are told. Uh, Emirates cancelled seven flights, for example. Uh, so we'll wait and see if people do manage to eventually get home after, you know, what must have caused some damage. Little cat rescued, uh, mewing anyway. Uh, let's go to The Sun. It's also on the front page of the Daily Mail, as we saw. Um, Prince Harry saying goodbye to Britain. Oh, good luck to him. I hope he takes his uh, Uncle Andy with him. Aren't we? Well, he won, 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 a prize of, <laughs> won a prize in the polo match. <laughs> day, so fair play to the yeah. guys. Polo yeah. game's doing quite well there. So Prince Harry has officially regist registered even himself as an American... Resident. Resident, thank you, 
uh, cutting ties with the UK. It feels quite final when you when you hear it like that, doesn't it? Yeah, you always come back, though. People do, don't they? Yeah. Should he wish? I mean, should something happen in his life? Should He's he not got rid of his UK passport. He's subject no. to American tax regulations now. That's should, there, should there be a divorce or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> See you both uh, in a bit. Thank you both very much indeed. Kevin Maguire, Ali Mirage, thank you. Here's the weather. So there will be a change tomorrow with showers replaced by more general rain spreading across northern and central parts. There'll be a mostly fine start with a slight frost for many, but there will be rain for northwest Scotland and a few fog patches in the west. So Scotland and northern England will see cloud and mainly light rain spreading from the northwest then on strengthening winds tomorrow morning. And Northern Ireland may catch a few drizzly outbreaks. Most other places look fine after any early fog lifts, but Ireland and central Britain can expect a fair amount of cloud. It'll be a bit milder than recently. Central Britain will see patchy rain moving in during the afternoon, while northern Scotland will see cloud and rain giving way to sunshine and showers. Elsewhere, south-east England will cloud over, while the south of Ireland will brighten up. Britain will have quite a windy, showery start on Friday, but the showers will clear from the northwest and the wind will ease. Inland areas look mostly dry and calm into the evening. Well, just some breaking news for you. Man City are out of the Champions League, losing to Real Madrid on penalties. You remember it went into extra time. More on that after this.